welcome to the Kid Missing in the This time we're going to be talking about cases of children who have been missing for over 30 years. First, I would like to give you an update on a case that we talked about on our last episode, the case of Angelo Andy Puglisi. On September 16th, there was a search with canine, 10 canine units, including the Massachusetts State Police canine unit, and many, many others, including forensic anthropologist Anne Marie Myers, who actually identified the body of Molly Bish. Um, she says, if we don't find him in these searches, he's not here because they're not giving up until they know 100% for certain that he is not there by the pool where he was taken from. Um, she also said that it's been 38 years. Um, and in order for the dogs to tell if there was a burial event or to smell anything, they need a little help. So what they did was they aerated the soil. It's very interesting. It's kind of like sifting flour. You make it lighter, you make it fluffier, <laughs> you get, put air into it and it allows, the, the soil gets looser and lighter and it, it allows for the scent that may be down there from a very long time ago to come up for the dogs to have easier access to it. Um, so I found that actually very interesting. Um, Dr. Myers also worked on the documentary, Have You Seen Andy, that we spoke about. Um, you'll see Andy's poster again, just as a reminder. Um, we will keep you updated on any further updates from this case. I wish this was a solved update, but it's not. Um, but they're not giving up, and I think that's wonderful. Like I said, we will bring you further updates as they become available. Stephen Craig Demon was two years old when he disappeared on Halloween Day, 1955, from East Meadow, Long Island, New York. It's going to sound strange to people today, but back then this wasn't strange. His mom left him and his seven-month-old sister. She was in uh, the stroller, the buggy, they called it. She left them outside the grocery store. She was just going in to get a few things. Like I said, it was common back then. Uh, she came out, and to her horror, neither of her children were there. A little bit later, the buggy was found, the baby was unharmed. Stephen has never been found. In 2009, a man thought he was Stephen. He had DNA tested, and he was not Stephen. Um, Stephen's DNA was also tested against that of the boy in the box, America's unknown child, that we spoke about last time. Um, today, Stephen would be 61 years old and could very well still be alive and have been raised and not know that he was taken because of the age he was when he was taken. Um, if you have any information on this case, please contact the Nassau County Police at 516-573-7000. Elizabeth Beth Gill was two years, ten months old when she disappeared from Cape Girardeau, Missouri, her own front yard, June 13, 1965. Um, she's believed to have been taken by a group of people who were staying at a motel, like a motor inn, you know, um, that was behind her parents' home. And they were selling purses. They were borderline criminals. Um, here in this clip, her sister Martha, who I was privileged to have on my show, and I'm even more privileged to call my friend, Martha Gill Hamilton, explains about this. There was a group that uh, were traveling through town. Um, in fact, they're known as travelers, and they were going door to door. And there were a number of reasons that the police started looking at them. 
um, we the, unfortunately the people that we know for sure were in Cape Girardeau uh, are either deceased or um, physically or mentally cannot uh, be interviewed. But uh, we have located some family members, although they've not given us any answers. We have. Uh, reasons to believe that they know more than they're willing to say at this time. Um, in 2010, the FBI opened a case file on this case. Um, you can find more information about Beth at Finding Beth Gill on Facebook. Also, you'll notice the poster is a little different than from my normal posters because it's not. It's a poster that the family actually gave me um, that they made because all the sisters have very similar characteristics, so they placed pictures of each of Beth's sisters as adults at the bottom because they believe that Beth would look like her sisters. So, <coughs> you'll also notice um, during the last clip and during the next clip that I'm about to play for you that Beth's mother is still alive it's a picture of Beth's mother holding a poster asking for help finding her daughter. Um, and that's kind of even more near and dear to me than it ever was because I recently found my grandmother's daughter. And I would love to give this woman the same happiness and joy that I was able to give my grandmother. Um, I'd like to play another clip for you of Martha Gill Hamilton. Um, it's about Team Hope, a program for families of the missing um, sponsored by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. She's been involved in for a very long time. Now you also have, is, is it called Project Hope? Team Hope. Team Hope. Can you Team tell Hope us is about a that? group um, under the National, uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and we try to give uh, emotional support and advice somewhat to families of the missing. The members in Team Hope, and I think there's between 110 and 120 members, are all families of missing children. Um, if you have any information, oh, before I do that, DNA has been done on nine different women, and they all came back negative. There's a strong belief that Elizabeth is alive. Um, also, the people involved in the case, unfortunately, because 50 years have passed as of next June, you know, if they were 30 years old then, they're pretty darn old now. Some are deceased. Um, two of them that they would have liked to speak to uh, have Alzheimer's or dementia and are uninterviewable, so either they had to, either somebody had to be told in order for this to be solved, or somebody had to overhear something, suspect something, or a younger member of the family, maybe, any one of those things in order for this to be solved. But if you have any information, you can call um, Detective Jim Smith at the Cape Girardeau, Missouri Police Department, extension 1120. 573-335-6621. Victor John, Jackie, as he was called, Thiel, was six years old when he disappeared from Painesville, Minnesota, September 5th, 1944. Jackie was walking home for lunch from school. They didn't have school lunches back then. Um, I learned this from a 90-year-old relative, actually, um, who used to walk home with his sister. I thought that was pretty neat. His mom made him change his suit every day. <laughs> um, and it was his first day of first grade. He pointed in the wrong direction when the teacher asked him how to get home. And I guess she pointed him in, in the right direction, but he never made it. His mother would have preferred his brother walk him home. Um, there were a few sightings along the way. Um, a couple returning from Long Lake 
near Hawick that day, reported seeing a small boy wearing the blue suit standing along Highway 23, which uh, around 1 p.m., which is where the bloodhounds had tracked Jackie Scent. And later that evening, two local boys had reported a boy also on Highway 23. Um, but when the police checked out the story of the two boys, they found that it was actually a soldier and his brother who stopped to get a new starter in their car. It wasn't Jackie. <coughs> Jackie's mother got a letter from a former Painesville school teacher who said she saw someone that resembled a Thiel getting off a Navy ship in California in the 1960s. He signed his name Jackie Thiel and told the teacher that he had been adopted. Was that their brother? It's impossible to know, said Faye Thiel, Jackie's brother, about his brother's fate. You don't know if he's dead or alive. In the 1980s, Faye was told that a man came to Tuck's Cafe in Painesville looking for his family but could not find any Thiel's in the phone book. That's kind of sad. Um, Jackie had a disability, although no one's really clear about what the disability was. Um, and the search for him was amazing. Hundreds of volunteers, farmers, businessmen, Boy Scouts, Civil Air Patrol, everybody you can imagine. Um, if you have any information on this case, you can call the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension at 651 793-7000. Daniel Danny Barter was six years old when he disappeared June 18, 1959 from the Perdido, from the Perdido Bay, excuse me, Alabama. When Danny vanished from his family's campsite, he was still wearing the gray boxers he slept in and was barefoot. Um, the searches included the Navy, three award-winning bloodhounds, uh, hundreds of volunteers. They searched the beach. No footprints were found in the sand leading in, and Danny hated the water. The beach is just a few miles from the U.S. Route 98 bridge into Florida. This is a scary thought. Bloodhounds repeatedly tracked his scent to a nearby road. The case was finally reopened in 2008. In 2009, AC360 did a story on, the, um, on Danny. The Barters did see a truck with a man and a woman inside the morning Danny disappeared. And they only took note of it because the road is seldom used, but the campground is on. So they, it struck them as odd. Um, his mother said, and this is kind of sad, if they or someone else did take Danny, it could have been because they were strongly attracted to him. Because, as you can see from the posters, he's just a lovely little boy. Um, it, I would like to thank my friend Lynn Rias. That's R E U S S. Um, for helping me with this case, for bringing this case to my attention. Uh, she's an amazing woman who has worked with a family family has publicly thanked her. Uh, she used to have a website for Danny and also for Mississippi Delta Dawn who um, was unceremoniously dumped off a bridge into the Mississippi River age about two. Um, and that that's Lynn's passion. If you have any information on Danny Barter please call the Baldwin County Sheriff Huey Haas Mac at 251-937-0210 or the Mobile District FBI Office at 251-438-3674. Police and the FBI had a $5,000 reward on offer as of 2009. I don't know whether this reward is still on offer or not. Beverly Potts was 10 years old when she disappeared from Cleveland, Ohio, August 21st, 1951. I was fortunate enough to have the author of Twilight of Innocence, The Disappearance of Beverly Potts, 
You'll see the book cover floating around while you listen to him talk in the, in the clips that I have um, for you to hear. And his name is James Jessen Badal, B-A-D-A-L. Um, the little girl was walking to Halloran Park to see what was called a show wagon you know, with her friend. As a matter of fact, they went there twice because they rode their bikes there, but it was way too busy for them to get their bikes anyway at the stage. So they took their bikes home and returned. Um, about 8.45, her friend, Patsy, became a little nervous and decided she was going to go home because her, her mom had let her stay out a little longer than her mom wanted her to because she was going to be with her friend, Beverly, and... Beverly had permission to stay for the whole show wagon. Um, there were 1,500 people in that park, and it seems to me somebody had to see something. Um, it is believed that Beverly is still somewhere in the neighborhood. Um, first clip I'd like to play you is is just Dr. Bandal going over. Um, what happened that evening? Well, Beverly and her best friend, her next door neighbor, Patsy Swing, were going to the show wagon performance. And they left about ooh, quarter of eight. The show started at eight. This is literally a two minute ride away from their bicycles. When they got there, they discovered that there were 1,500 people there. They couldn't get to the, close to the stage with their bicycles, and there was no safe place they could leave them. So they decided to take their bicycles home and go back. And as they were coming back, Mrs. Swing stuck her head out the window and said, it's getting late, Patsy, you better come in. And Patsy said, well, Beverly's mother said she could go to the show. Can't I go too? And she said, well, okay, but be home by dark. Beverly's mother, Elizabeth, and died in 1956. They say of a broken heart. Um, her father died many years later and stayed in the home. It's actually quite sad. Um, there was never a body found. Beverly was never found. Um, although there were tips, police followed up on, interviewed folks, there was never a suspect or a person of interest. Um, this next clip is the prevailing theory. Um, and, and Dr. Badal does a good job explaining about the reason for this theory, the theory that she's still there somewhere. Most of the garages there in that neighborhood were made of dirt at that time. So she could have been buried under one of them. But he'll talk about that. He'll talk about all of that in this clip. And so if somebody took her, and it's beginning to look like that's what happened, it had to be somebody she would trust completely. I hate to say it, but a policeman, a priest, I don't know. I wonder if, as has been stated everywhere that I've read, <coughs> excuse me, if her remains are still somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, someone said that most of the garages were dirt floors. Well, that's uh, I said that in my book, and uh, I was told that by a policeman who worked on the case uh, in the early 90s. If you have any information about the disappearance of Beverly Potts, please call the Cleveland PD at 760-839-4722. Amy Billig was 17 years old when she disappeared from Coconut Grove, Florida um, on March 5, 1974. Amy um, had come home and she wanted money from her dad. Uh, buy shoes or something. And she called him at his office and he said, Sure, come by my office. I'll give you a few dollars. So she was going to hitch a ride to his office. That wasn't uncommon back then whatsoever. 
she never made it. <clears throat> the prevailing theory about what happened to Amy is that she was abducted by bikers, drugged, made someone's old lady, um, and maybe sold to another biker gang or whatever. Well, a biker with a good heart tried to help Amy's mother, Susan. Um, even brought her to a biker bar, brought her to their world, tried to get somebody to talk to her. Well, all that got for him was several broken bones because he got the tar beat out of him and he wasn't in a hurry to help after that because he valued his life and his bones. So you can't really blame him at that point um, at all. <laughs> I wouldn't be too hooked on helping someone either. Um, the strangest lead came from a private detective who was standing in an English post office when a man, appearing to be a biker, walked up to him and offered to sell him the Coconut Grove girl. Say what? <laughs> so he realized who it was right away and called Susan Billing. Um, Susan wrote a book. Um, without a trace about her experiences in trying to find her daughter um, and everything that, that she went through, which a lot of it was documented on the program Unsolved Mysteries. Um, Amy's father died of a heart attack not, not many years after Amy disappeared. Um, Amy's mother passed away in 2005 at age 80. She made her son promise right on Unsolved Mysteries, that he would continue the search for his sister. As far as I know, he has. Um, Amy's parents are now with her, chances are, and know what happened, but her brother deserves to know and deserves to be able to put her earthly remains with their parents. Um, if you have any information about the case of Amy Billig, please call the Miami Police Department at 305-579-6530. This is our special feature case. This is called the Iowa Paperboy Mystery. Originally, it was reported that all three boys were paper boys. Actually, they weren't. Um, the first two were Johnny Gosh, age 12, September 5th, 1982, and Eugene Martin, 13, August 12th, 1984, were both paper boys. Mark Allen was not, although, as I said, he was originally reported to have been. Um, he was 13 when he disappeared March 29, 1986, all from Des Moines, West Des Moines, Iowa. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is Johnny, but I have to tell you, Johnny Gosh's story is worse than a jigsaw puzzle with the little bitty pieces. I, it's horrible to try to put together without sitting here for like eight hours. <laughs> So, I had to condense it. <laughs> Give you the Reader's Digest condensed version. Um, Johnny was abducted uh, while he was getting his papers to deliver them. Um, a man in a car drove up, asked him for directions. He was a little freaked out. He said to his friend, I'm done getting my papers. I'm out of here. And the person turned back around and asked the adult carrier the same question. Um, and that vehicle was heard not too far away from there because it had a loud muffler. It was before dawn because that's when they get their papers. And um, they woke, he, the vehicle, believed to be a Ford Fairmont, blue, woke a couple up out of sleep. Um, they did look out the window at the car but they didn't see a little boy. So whether this was this car was involved in the abduction, we don't know for sure. Um, Johnny was the first missing child on a milk cart. Um, Johnny's mother also wrote a book. Her name is Noreen Gosh. Um, G-O-S-C-H, by the way. Um, 
She wrote a book called Why Johnny Can't Come Home. I'd be interested to read it. Um, a lot of people think that she's lost it. Um, probably mostly out of grief. I am not going to judge her here today. I'm, I'm not. Even though I think some of her ideas are out there, some of her ideas make sense. You know? So, you can't judge someone's grief. You know, and, and how they handle something like this. So, I refuse to do that. She believes he was taken by sex traffickers, which is actually not an unreasonable assumption. Somebody may be gaslighting this woman also because an envelope of pictures of bound boys, one of which she believes is Johnny, was left on her doorstep um, at one point in time, along with a picture of a man who appeared to be dead and strangled. Police didn't really take it seriously. Uh, Florida police somehow got involved and said, well, that was a case from the 70s or whatever. Uh, I don't know. I really don't. Um, therefore, it's not Johnny, period. Done. I don't know that. Because <coughs> um, different people have said different things about whether, you know, experts about whether it could be Johnny. Um, and one time, a gentleman who was blogging online was thought to be Johnny. Uh, in fact, when Johnny would have been 27 years old, a man brought a young man to visit her who supposedly had the same birthmark and was Johnny. Do I necessarily believe it was Johnny? I have no way of knowing for sure whether or not it was Johnny. I will say this, though. If somebody's gaslighting her, they're the ones that need professional help. Um, if you would do that to a grief-stricken woman, you know? Um, and she believes that he can't come home because he's still being held by the traffickers and being threatened. Um, interestingly, there was a scandal um, from 1988 to 1991 the Franklin Boys Town scandal. The Franklin scandal, the Boys Town scandal, you can look it up all different ways. I didn't go into too much detail here with that um, in my notes or plan to on the show because it's too complicated. <laughs> Basically, what it came down to was um, a man named Lawrence E. King Jr. of the uh, president of the Franklin Credit Union supposedly had ties to a sex ring out of Boys Town, which was supposed to be a place to help boys. Many boys have testified and done interviews stating the, uh, things about their abuse, and I found most of them to be credible, and you can see these online. Um, there are several websites dedicated to this story. Two boys were indicted for perjury. Um, I thought that was utterly ridiculous because I did see one of two boys' testimony, maybe even both, um, in an interview that they did online. Well, actually it was on TV first. Um, and I found them to be credible, to be honest with you. Um, and she believes that these boys were a part of this. I think it's possible. Um, she talks about government cover-ups. We know that the Boys Town scandal was covered up by government, and that's why those indictments were handed down, because some of the victimizers were, you know, senators and whatnot, and they want to get in trouble. Um, that That's absolutely proven. You can, like I said, go online and look it up. Um, not naming any names, but, um, nor, nor, the, nor do I remember any of the names, too many, but it's absolutely proven. In fact, it was blocked it was supposed to be a, a dateline, I think it was, or 2020, one of, one of the two, um, had, had put together an entire show on it, and it got kiboshed. But if you go on, there, there are documentary sites, um, where you can watch documentaries for free, where you can actually see 
the show that never aired about this because the kibosh was put to it. <clears throat> Tells me all I need to know. Um, the second little boy that disappeared disappeared almost identically to Johnny um, with one glaring difference to me. Uh, Eugene was again picking up, picked up his papers to deliver them, same as Johnny. Um, the difference is when Eugene's papers didn't get delivered, people called the newspaper. When Johnny's papers didn't get delivered, they called Johnny's house and Johnny's father went. Why didn't people call Eugene's house and why didn't the manager, when he found Eugene's bag outside of Des Moines in an intersection, not call Eugene's parents? It wasted a lot of time. Then Eugene's mother finds out she can't report him missing for 48 hours? Okay, then. Of course, back then, that was not uncommon. <coughs> um, Detective Raleigh says this is the only case that really still bothers him. Here's a large poster of Eugene in his um, garage hanging up. It's a big... Um, and he said it will stay there. Until this is solved or until that day I die. <laughs> I like this guy. Um, and he was on the case until 2001. Um, authorities said they were treating the Martin case as a kidnapping and had issued a nationwide bulletin for a man. Um, and I'm assuming this description is of the man that people said they saw him speaking with who looked old enough to be his dad. Um, he's described as being between 30 and 40 years of age, 5 feet and 9 inches tall, clean shaven with a medium belt. It's not much of a description, you know, in terms of anything specific because uh, it doesn't narrow it down much. Uh, Eugene's father... His name is Donald Martin. He actually um, passed away in December of 2010, December 27th. Told his daughter before he died, he said, I don't want to die. I want to know that Eugene's there waiting for me. Um, well, he got his answer when he got there. Um, when he got to heaven. This man was pretty amazing, and I wanted to, to salute him. He's a hero. Uh, he died of Alzheimer's disease and colon cancer. He served in the U.S. Army during the Vietnam War from 1963 to 1966. He earned several medals, the Good Conduct Medal, the Expert M1 Rifle Medal, Sharpshooter M14 Medal, along with the Vietnam Service Medal. I salute you, sir. Um even though many people did not when you came home. Um, Mark Allen, the third boy that went missing, was actually walking to a friend's house um, the evening before Easter. When he didn't come home by the next day, his mom called her mom and said, hey, did Mark stop by to get his Easter basket? Mm, no. Okay, so she called the friend's house, and the friend said, he never showed up last night. I don't know, wouldn't you call your friend to see where he was if he didn't show up? Or wouldn't, if I were a parent and I knew that my child's friend was walking to my house and it was supposed to be there a certain time, I'd call the other parent. That wasted a lot of time. Again. Um... Mrs. Allen did an interview with an, a journalist called um, Burlback. Burlback, sorry. She didn't know whether her son's disappearance was linked to the disappearance of Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin or not, but said police seemed reluctant to help her because of the other missing deeds. This is what she said. This is really kind of disturbing. I just feel like at this time they were just afraid of afraid of what would happen with the Eugene Martin and Gosh thing. 
I got the distinct feeling that they did not want parents to be frightened to let their children sell newspapers or do different things, she said. How horrible and disturbing is that? Um, anyway, there is more on Johnny in particular at johnnygosh.com. Um, that's J-O-H-N-N-Y-G-O-S-C-H dot com. His mother has another website for him also <coughs> um, that you'll easily find if you Google Johnny Gosh. If you have any information in the disappearance of Johnny Gosh, you can call 515-222-3320. They're all different precincts of the same police department. If you have any information in the disappearance of Eugene Martin, you can call 515-283-4864. If you have any information in the disappearance of Mark Allen, you can call 514-283-4811. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Kid Missing TV. Um, as you can see, it's Christmas. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy New Year, whatever it is that you celebrate in your home. Uh, next time will be our 10th episode. We have made it into the double digits. Yay us. <laughs> um, thank you for making that possible. God bless you and good evening.